In this video, we'll take the principles from our last video, looking at uh, shear and moment forces inside a beam, and we'll use them to draw shear moment diagrams for actual loading conditions. This will get a little bit complex, but in each case, we'll use the same procedure. We will first find the reactions that it takes to keep the beam in external equilibrium, rotational and translational. And then we'll go inside the beam and we'll draw first a shear, moment, a shear diagram that looks at how each individual slice of the beam uh, has to develop internal shear or internal stresses to balance against whatever external loads uh, it's facing. We'll then use the shear diagram and the, uh, the, the relationships that it has with the moment diagram to draw the moment diagram and to find the maximum moment uh, in each case. So we'll start with a simply supported distributed load. This is one of the most common beam conditions we have uh, and also one of the easiest to solve for. So in this case, we have a 45 foot span and we have a 20 pound per linear foot distributed load uh, across the entire span. First thing we'll do, we replace the connections with reactions. They're pin connections. So we know that the moment has to equal zero uh, at both ends. And our first step will be to find the two reactions. It's a symmetrically loaded beam. So the reactions will be symmetrical and they'll each be equal to one half of the total load. And in this case, because it's a distributed load, that total load will be W, the amount of pounds per, per linear foot, times length the number of linear feet in the beam. Uh, and each reaction will take half of that load. So RL will equal RR, and each one of those will equal one half times the 20 pounds per linear foot times the 45 linear foot that that load is, is spread out across one half of 900 pounds. So each reaction will be 450 pounds, right? Taking uh, the 20 pound per linear foot, multiplying it by the length, and then dividing it equally between the two supports. We can only divide it equally if we know that the load is symmetrical. Otherwise, we have to go back and we have to do our uh, moment calculations, our equilibrium calculations for moment uh, around each of the supports. Here, though, relatively simple. A uh, fairly a trivial solution. So what we'll do next is we'll go inside the beam and we'll start with the left reaction and we'll try to think about what's happening to the beam as we move from left to right. So as we go from that 450 pound reaction and start tracking to the right across the beam. The first thing we notice is that when we go an infinite slice to the right of that 450 pounds, uh, we will have, before we get much buildup or much, uh, much of a force in the opposite direction from the distributed load, we'll have right at that infinitely thin slice uh, a 450 pound load pushing up and the beam will need to develop a 450 pound shear in the equal and opposite direction to resist that. So right at that very, very edge, the shear diagram will go up 450 pounds. And again, you can think about this either as what does it take to, uh, to make that slice stay in equilibrium, uh, or you can think of it just as the arrows on the loading diagram telling a story. So in this case, the reaction is pushing the diagram up by 450 pounds. Now, what happens next? Well, as we go across the beam, we still have that 450 pounds pushing up, but as we take slices further and further to the right, we find that there is more and more of the distributed load that's acting in the equal, in the opposite uh, direction, sorry. So as we go from left to right, what we find is that the quantity of shear that it takes to stabilize each individual slice as we go over gets less and less and less. You can think of it like this. Each one of the infinite number of little arrows in the distributed load is pushing that shear diagram a little bit. So what that shear diagram ends up looking like is a long sloping line. And to be perfectly accurate about it, this line has a slope of 20 pounds per linear foot. So every foot we go over, the line drops 20 pounds in shear. And we know that we have to hit a point on the right-hand side of the beam where the 
force or the, the reaction is going to push the diagram back up to zero. We know that it's going to be 450 pounds. So we know that the shear diagram on the right side has to end up at minus 450 pounds. Right? So we go up 450 pounds on the left. The reaction is pushing us up. Every one of these little tiny arrows in the distributed load is helping to push that shear diagram down a little bit at a constant slope of 20 pounds per linear foot. And at the opposite end, the shear diagram ends up at minus 450 pounds and it has to get pushed up by the reaction back to zero. We need to have zero shear, zero moment at the ends of each beam. So we get this very common, very distinctive bow tie shape for the shear diagram. Next, we draw the moment diagram. And to do this, the easiest way to think about this is to remember that the value of the shear diagram is always going to equal the slope of the moment diagram. So if we look at that shear diagram, what we see is a very, very high positive slope to start out with, gradually decreasing. The slope gets less and less and less. At the midpoint of the beam, we have what's called an inflection point where the shear diagram crosses zero. And what that means is that at that point, the slope of the moment diagram is going to equal zero. And then the moment diagram slope gets negative, more and more negative, steeper and steeper until finally we get uh, to, the, to the reaction on the right-hand side. So what that looks like is uh, a, an upside-down uh, curve or a frowny face, right, if you want to be technical about it. Notice that we've got a summit in the middle. The slope of the moment diagram there is zero. Slope of the moment diagram is steep, positive on the left, steeply negative on the right. And these two, the bow tie and the frowny face, they go hand in hand. You'll see these appear over and over again when we're looking at distributed loads on beams. If you're a fan of calculus, you will notice that one shape is the derivative of the other, right? Calculus is the study of changing slopes. And so this is really a kind of very, very simple example of calculus at work, that the shear diagram and the moment diagram are related through the, the derivative principle. Okay, to get a useful piece of information about this, we know where the greatest moment is, but what's the magnitude of that moment? And here what we'll do is we will look for an inflection point, and then we will use the other aspect of the relationship between shear and moment that we know about, namely that the area of the shear diagram up to a certain point is equal to the value of the moment diagram at that point. And we'll use that to actually calculate how much bending this beam is undergoing at, at its greatest. So we look at the inflection point because we know that's always going to be a summit or a valley in the moment diagram. It's always going to be a place where the slope goes from positive to negative. So it's always going to be at least a local uh, maximum uh, for, for the moment. And then we'll look at the area of the shear diagram. And here notice that the height is 450 pounds. The base is one half of the span, 45 feet or 22 and a half pounds. And if we take one half base times height, the area of the triangle formula, what we get is half times 450 pounds times 22 and a half feet, or a moment, an internal uh, moment of 5,062 and a half foot pounds. So we've done a couple of things. We know where the beam is stressed most in shear at the supports. We know where the beam is stressed the most in bending at the middle. And we have a magnitude for each one of those. As we go further and start to design the beam, we can use these figures now to understand uh, what, what internal forces we have to design the beam uh, to resist. Okay, final point about this example. Note the shape uh, curved deeper in the center uh, than at the ends. This is a classic beam shape. Today, because we use rolled shapes, we don't uh, very often get into the longitudinal shapes of beams. But back in the 19th century, when they were casting iron beams, they could manipulate the longitudinal shape of the beam quite easily. And in fact, you see a whole series of beams in mills being made out of cast iron, 1810s and 1820s, that take exactly this fish belly shape, that have a curved profile to them that matches pretty closely the shape of the moment diagram that the, that the uh, beam's loading is imparting on it.
These are the cross-sectional shapes. We'll get to those in the next set of videos, but for the moment, just look at these and know that the moment diagram typically tells us what the longitudinal shape of a beam wants to be, what the most efficient use of the material in the longitudinal direction will be. Okay, let's do one that's asymmetrically loaded. Uh, and we'll simplify it a bit. No distributed load. We're going to ignore the beam's own self-weight. And instead, we're going to design it just for two loads. Again, a 45-foot span. Uh, but now we have two loads at 20 and 10 feet from one of the supports, a 60-pound load and an 80-pound load. So as always, we'll first find the reactions. It's a pinned, uh, su the su supports are pin connections. So we know that we are going to have no moment uh, externally on either end of the beam. So we look at reaction left, reaction right, and we do our sum of moments around one or the other to find what those reactions are. I'll go through this a little bit quickly. Um, so we'll start with some of the moments around reaction right equals zero. And those will be the left-hand reaction times its moment arm, which note is 45 feet if we're looking at the impact around that support. That will be going clockwise. And the two uh, loads that we're putting onto the beam will be going in the opposite direction. They will be putting a counterclockwise moment around the right-hand support. So the 60-pound load has a moment arm of 20 feet. The 80 pound load has a moment arm of 10 feet. Those are negative because they're going in the opposite direction, counterclockwise instead of clockwise, like the left reaction is going. We can multiply those together so we get everything here in foot pounds, add the two moments together. These two together are imparting a moment of 2,000 foot pounds in the anti clockwise direction around the right hand support. If we move that to the right-hand side, and now we're going to divide both sides by 45 feet so that we get figures that are just in pounds. And what we find is that the reaction left has to be 44.4 pounds. We can either then do the sum of the moments around the left reaction, or slightly simpler, we can just do some of the forces in the vertical direction. Uh, here we have 44.4 pounds pushing the beam up. Here we have 60 and 80 pounds pushing the beam down. And RR is going to have to make up whatever the difference is between all three of those uh, forces. Again, we're talking about external equilibrium, just trying to find the reactions before we dive in and look at the internal equilibrium uh, of the beam. So if we add all those together, we find that 44.4 minus 60 minus 80 equals 95.56, or let's call it 95.6. And that will be the reaction on the right-hand side of the beam. So these two keep the beam in rotational equilibrium. They keep the beam in, in the translational equilibrium as well. So now we have four external forces acting on the beam, and we'll follow exactly the same procedure that we did for the distributed load now that we've found the reactions. We will look at the magnitude and direction of all of the external forces, loads and reactions, and we'll try to think about what's happening inside the beam as we go from left to right. So again, if we go an infinite slice to the right of that reaction, we'll find that that little free body has the reaction, 44.4 pounds pushing up. We'll need to develop an internal shear stress of 44.4 pounds going down to resist that. We call that a positive shear. This is so that all of the shear and moment diagrams uh, coordinate. And the other way we can think about this, of course, is that the shear diagram gets pushed up by the reaction by 44.4 pounds. Now, all throughout this 25-foot uh, piece of the beam, that is the only external force that we're worried about if we're taking free bodies that get larger and larger and larger. So for that whole part of the span, the internal shear stays at 44.4. Remember, we're just talking about vertical translation. So if we take the slice there, or if we take the slice right up just before we get to the 60 pound load, the beam is feeling the same external force and it's having to build up the same internal stress uh, to resist that. 
Once we get to the right of that 60 pound force, what we find is that the diagram gets pushed down by 60 pounds. Or you can think of it as the internal stress that we need now to hold up the free body to the left of a slice we make here uh, has to be equal to the difference between 60 pounds and 44.4 pounds or 15.6. Notice that the shear diagram drops into negative territory, and notice also that it crosses the zero line. So that'll be important when we come to the moment diagram. Between the two loads, the shear will stay stable as we go from the 60 pound load over toward the 80 pound load, taking larger and larger free bodies we don't yet know, or the beam doesn't yet feel the 80 pound uh, load that we're imparting on it. Once we get past that, the shear diagram gets pushed down an additional 80 pounds, down to 95.6 pounds negative. And again, you can think of it uh, as the, the internal shear stress in the beam that's needed to counteract the sum total of those three forces. That all works out nicely. Uh, that shear value stays the same all the way to the right-hand edge of the beam, and then, happily, the 95.6 pound reaction pushes us back up to zero. Right? So the beam is in uh, equilibrium. All of the stresses are resolved within the, within the beam itself. Okay, slightly less elegant shear diagram than in our distributed load. Um, we'll use that though to draw the moment diagram. And again, keeping in mind that the value of the shear diagram equals the slope of the moment diagram. So just for the moment, thinking about what the shape of the moment diagram needs to be, Notice that we have a positive slope from the left reaction all the way to the first load. We have an inflection point or a summit in the moment diagram. We have a shallow negative slope and then a very steep negative slope. And we know that the moment is going to be zero at both ends of the, of the beam. So we go up and uh, you can think of this as going up 44.4 pounds for every foot that we go across. We drop down and we have a shallow slope here dropping at 15.6 pounds for every foot that we go across. And then we have a very sharp steep drop at 95.6 pounds for every foot we go across until we hit a zero. So that is the shape of the moment diagram. We'll then find the inflection point where the shear uh, is equal to zero and we'll use that to calculate the maximum moment in the beam using the area principle of the shear diagram. So there is our inflection point. That's where the shear diagram crosses zero. That is in fact a summit on our moment diagram. And now we can either calculate the area of this rectangle or calculate the area of those two rectangles. Either one of those will give us the maximum moment, right? The value of the moment diagram at that point. So since this one will be easier, uh, let's do this. Note that we have a height of 44.4 pounds and we have a length of 25 feet, zero inches. So we will get a value in foot pounds, which is what we measure moments in. And the math is fairly simple. 44.4 times 15.6 gives us about 1,110 foot pounds. Let's do one more, and this one we will uh, we'll make it a little bit more complicated and hopefully also something that's a little bit uh, more beautiful uh, than, than that last one. Here we have a beam with a double cantilever. We have 100 pound loads on each end of the cantilever, and then in between the supports, we have a distributed load of 20 pounds per linear foot. So even though this is gonna be more complicated, we follow exactly the same procedure. And the trick here is just to try to keep track of where we are in the process, make sure we're accounting for all loads and reactions in every step uh, that we make. First things first, we'll find the reactions, just like any other beam. And here note that it's symmetrically loaded, so we're cutting ourselves a little bit of a break there. The reactions are gonna be simple. Each one of them is simply going to be half of the total load that we're uh, applying to the beam. If we want to write that out mathematically, each reaction is going to be one half, because they're sharing equally, uh, of the distributed load, 20 pounds per linear foot, times 25 feet, 
plus 100 pounds point load plus 100 pounds point load. So we multiply 20 pounds per linear feet by the 25 feet. We end up with 500 pounds. 100 pounds plus 100 pounds equals 200 pounds. And we have to remember to divide that by half, or divide that by two, sorry, to get each individual reaction. Total load on the beam will be 700 pounds. Each reaction shares that equally, which means that each reaction is going to be equal to 350 pounds. Okay, now things get fun. We're going to draw a shear diagram of this, and notice that if we go from left to right, we aren't going to be starting with the reaction. We're going to be starting with that first 100-pound load that we're putting on the beam all the way at the left end uh, of, the, of the cantilever span. No worries. Instead of the shear diagram starting by going up, the shear diagram is going to start by going down, and it's going to go down by 100 pounds. Think about it this way. We have a 100-pound load pushing the beam down. As we slice the beam into free bodies and those get bigger and bigger and bigger, every slice along this cantilevered portion is going to have to develop an equal and opposite internal stress to that one external load to keep that piece of the beam in equilibrium, translational equilibrium. So down 100 pounds, the shear stress within all of that cantilever portion is going to be 100 pounds in the opposite direction than we're used to, right? We're starting out with the shear diagram below the, uh, the line, below the zero line instead of above it. When we hit this first reaction, that reaction will push the diagram up by 350 pounds. And so we'll get an internal shear stress. When we go an infinitely small amount to the right of that reaction, we'll have a, a shear stress in the opposite direction of 250 pounds. And again, think about taking a slice to ignore the distributed load for just a little bit. We're only going just a tiny slice to the right here. Uh, what internal stress has to develop to balance out the sum total of all of the forces up to that point? 100 minus 350 means that we need a, an internal stress of 250 pounds to resist those two forces. Keep going with the story. As we move further to the right in the beam, over the center part of the span, we get the distributed load starting to kick in. And every slice we take to the right now has a different internal stress that it has to develop to match, to equal, to resist the sum total of 100 pounds pushing down, 350 pounds pushing up, and 20 pounds for every foot that we go over. Again, you can think about it as an infinite number of little arrows, each pushing the shear diagram down a little bit at a rate of 20 pounds for every linear foot we go over. And that will give us a bow tie shape just in that center part of the span. And note, simple supports, distributed load, bow tie. When we get to the right reaction, here we have another 350 pound reaction that's going to push the diagram up we'll end up at minus 250 pounds. We can calculate that by saying 20 pounds, or 20 pounds per linear foot times 25 feet minus 350. We can also just do this by intuition, right? This is a symmetrically loaded beam, and therefore the shear moment diagrams are both going to be symmetrical. Shear diagram will be rotationally symmetrical. The moment diagram will be uh, regularly symmetrical. So if we have a 250 pound peak here on the opposite side of a symmetrically loaded beam, we'll have a 250 pound valley in the shear diagram. That reaction pushes us up 350 pounds. Note we're at 100 pounds here. We have a 100 pound load on the end of the beam that's gonna push us back down to zero. So again, two ways to think this through. Either think about slicing the beam into free bodies summing up all the forces to one side or the other and coming up with a figure for an internal stress to resist that, or the shortcut is to simply follow the arrows and see what they're doing to the direction and shape of the, of the shear diagram. Here's where it gets fun. Now we'll use the shear diagram to determine the shape of the moment diagram. 
And here again, the value of the shear diagram is always equal to the slope of the moment diagram. So what's it going to be? We start with a consistent negative slope, 100 pounds for every foot we go over. We have an inflection point here, the shear diagram crosses zero, and we get a positive slope that starts off steep, has an inflection point at the mid-span, so levels out, and then starts to get negative, steeply negative, until it reaches the right reaction. And then notice that we have a positive consistent slope of 100 pounds per foot as we go from the reaction over to the edge of the beam. So here, negative slope of 100 pounds for every foot we go over, an inflection point or a change of slope here, we go from negative to positive. We start off steep, we plateau or summit at the midpoint, and we end up getting more and more negative, more steeply negative until we get to the reaction. And then note that we have a positive 100 pound per linear foot slope to get us back to zero at the opposite end. That's kind of a pretty moment diagram. And it looks vaguely structural. It looks like a bridge. And no surprise, this is because bridges follow the, uh, the, the shape of their ideal bending diagram, whether we're designing an arch or a beam bridge. Now, finding the maximum moment is going to be a little tricky here because, first of all, we have three inflection points. So we uh, may find that the maximum moment is at the mid-span, as in our previous distributed load example. But notice that we also have inflection points over both of the supports. The shear uh, diagram crosses the zero line three times. Now, fortunately, because it's symmetrical, we can say that the moment here and the moment here are going to be equal. So really, we only have two conditions that we need to calculate, but we need to calculate both conditions because we may have a negative moment that's much greater than the positive moment, or the positive moment may be much greater than the negative moment. We don't know that without actually going in and doing the math. So again, remember that the moment at any point along the moment diagram is equal to the area of the shear diagram up to that point. So if we're going left to right, the value of the moment diagram here is equal to the area of the shear diagram here. And note that this is all negative. The moment's going to be negative, so this should work out. We'll calculate that area, and because it's just a rectangle, this is pretty simple. 100 pounds vertical dimension, 10 feet horizontal dimension, foot pounds, that's good, we're calculating moment. The maximum moment here, we might call that a local max, but for the moment we'll just keep it simple and just say M max, is 1,000 foot pounds, right? The area of this rectangle. Okay, now we have to calculate for this local summit, right? The other inflection point where the shear uh, diagram crosses zero. And here what we need to do is we need to take the total area of this rectangle and also this triangle, right? These two notice are going in opposite directions. The rectangle is negative, the triangle is positive. So the value of the moment diagram here is going to be the difference between that triangular area and that rectangular area. Note that we don't know if that moment is gonna be positive or negative, right? We've, made, we've sort of made a hunch here that it's gonna be positive, but it could very well end up that that moment diagram ends up below the zero line as well. We have to do the math, go back and revise if, if we need to. So we'll just do the, the calculation. And here again, there's a little bookkeeping to do, just making sure that we've picked up every piece of the shear diagram. So the maximum moment is going to be the area of the triangle, one half base times height. Here's our one half. Here's our base, 12.5 feet. Here's our height, 250 pounds. And then the value of that is going to be equal to that triangle minus the area of the rectangle, 1,000 foot pounds. If we go ahead and do the math, 125 pounds, one half times 250, multiply these together, 125 pounds times 12.5 feet, we get 1,562.5 foot pounds, feet and pounds. This is good, we're working in moments. We have two figures that have the same, uh, the, the, that are in the same units. So we can subtract them relatively easily and we find that the local 
maximum moment here is just 562.5 foot-pounds. So even though we have a maximum moment here, for designing one single beam, the greatest moment, the greatest bending stress we'll need to design for is a thousand foot-pounds. But we're interested in this as well, right? It may be that we're trying to fine tune the beam. We have two different local maximums uh, to contend with. And notice too, that a negative moment and a positive moment, the beam doesn't care, right? The beam doesn't really feel the difference between positive and negative, except as we get into where the tension and compression have to be, what we find is that those actually flip and that when we have a, 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 a positive moment, we have tension on the bottom, compression in the top. We have a negative moment, we have tension in the top and compression in the bottom. Okay, just to point out that this shape is in fact structural. Uh, here is an aircraft hangar by the great uh, Chicago architect and engineer Myron Goldsmith, where you can see that he has got uh, a, a distributed load with long cantilevers to hold up uh, roofs over the aircraft hangar bays. Uh, this is, was at San Francisco uh, Airport. And you can see that Goldsmith, being both an engineer and an architect, has designed this super girder to reflect that there is a simple span in the middle and cantilevers on the end. And that shape of the beam follows very closely the moment diagram that we just drew, right? Uh, small getting bigger and bigger and bigger, a uh, little bit of a curve to the base there, and then big getting smaller and smaller and smaller up to the tip. The moment diagrams show us the shape that the beam really wants to be. And if we're trying to be really, really rigorous about how much material we use, we we'll want to fine tune our longitudinal beam shapes to those moment diagram shapes. For simple conditions, uh, we have pretty well-known formulas that we can shortcut all of this and just go straight to uh, both moment diagrams and maximum shear and maximum moment. Um, these you can use uh, so long as you can guarantee yourself that this is the, the way the loads are actually uh, tracking out. If you look, you see some familiar shapes here. Here is simply supported beam with a distributed load, the bow tie and the frowny face. Note that that shows up as well if we have a teeter-totter that has a distributed load on it, right? The bow tie flips around, as does the, the smiley face, but the curves there and the slopes are exactly the same. And then here's the kind of arch bridge that we just did, the double cantilever. Uh, regular cantilever under distributed load, regular cantilever under a point load, and here you have max shear and max moment uh, for, for each of these. We'll get into maximum deflection as we get further into uh, beam design and we look at things like what the letter I in those equations tends to stand for. For the moment, it's important just to understand uh, how we get to maximum moment, how we go through and design uh, the, the, or how we go through and draw the shear diagram and use that to get the shape of the moment diagram use the inflection points and the area of the shear diagram to figure out the value of maximum moment. That will become important as we go forward. When we do beam design, it's the maximum moment and the maximum shear that we're typically designing actual elements to.